Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar titled Question Strategies for Step 2 CK. My name is Moses. I am an internal medicine resident as well as a tutor with Med School Tutors. And I'm really excited to share this hour with Dr. Michael Trainer. Uh, Michael, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Michael. I'm a second year neurology resident and as well as a tutor. Awesome. What we will be covering today is really getting you all set up for success when it comes to step two CK. We'll do that by comparing and contrasting with uh, step one. Uh, we'll talk briefly about how to go about uh, picking a plan, including the resources that you might consider using, some considerations when putting together a study schedule, and how to think about assessments and keeping yourself on track. But really the bulk of what we'll talk about today uh, will revolve around question strategies and some themes that emerge in the many hundreds of hours that we have spent tutoring students as they prepare for this exam. And we'll do that by going through some sample questions to really give you the inside scoop on how we think about problems, how we approach problem solving when it comes to these questions. At the very end, we'll have a live Q&A where you can put your questions in the chat. We'll do our best to address each of these uh, questions, both as they come up through the chat, but we will have a dedicated period of time at the end to address those questions. Now, I will note that if you have questions that are very personal or that would really require um, a longer follow-up, um, we encourage you to reach out via any of the email addresses, phone numbers, or social media accounts at the bottom of the slides, and we would be really happy to follow up with you. And throughout, we really encourage your participation, so we'll be pausing every once in a while to ask you a question about a topic that we're discussing it really helps cement some of these co uh, concepts when uh, you're active in the chat. And if we're looking off to the side or typing as, as the other uh, host is speaking, we're still paying attention. We're probably responding via the chat uh, with a question that uh, one of your colleagues has posted. I, just a brief word about med school tutors. Some of you are probably aware of who we are, but for those uh, who are new to our family, uh, we are a group of individuals in the medical field really spanning from the pre-medical stage all the way through attendings who have uh, walked the walk that you are all on now. Um, we have taken these same exams, we've uh, experienced the stress ourselves, and we're interested in partnering with you, mentoring you, and helping you achieve your ultimate goals and not letting these examinations be a barrier to that. That looks like one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Um, it also can involve uh, coaching when it comes to applications. There's a whole range of different ways in which we could help you. If you're interested, again, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We would really love to hear from you. Uh, we'll have a little bit more uh, content on who we are at MST at the very end. But right now, I want to jump right in and talk about step one versus step two. So I'll turn it over to, to Michael. Yeah, so I think the one of the most intimidating things is sort of being done with step one, stepping back from it, taking a little bit of a break, and then kind of mustering up the strength to come back and take step two and all the fears about what's different. I'm happy to remind you that medicine does not change. The same diseases that you studied for step one are gonna be the same diseases that you have to study for step two. Um, so right out of the gate, I don't want you to feel like you have to climb a whole new mountain. So similarities, right? The basic pathophys of disease, heart failure is heart failure. You're gonna see it on step one, step two, step three, and clinically, it's all gonna be the same. You're still gonna to have to interpret labs and images. Kind of the way that things are gonna be described to you is not different. Um, the way that questions are written is not different, right? Questions, what is the next best step or what is the most likely outcome of this intervention, right? So sort of second and third order questions. Um, we're going to stay loyal to UWorld. Uh, you're not done with it for, for quite a bit longer. Um, there's practice tests, just the same. Same people author the questions. So you're gonna see a lot of the same themes come up. I think some of our practice questions today, you'll, you'll be like, mate, are these really step two questions? Like, I think they could have been step one questions. 
Um, the other thing that there's there's demands on your time, but you're also going to learn a whole lot of stuff on the job. You're going to see people worked up in the hospital the same way that they want you to work people up in questions. Um, and so I think that was sort of the biggest takeaway for me is sort of this not feeling there was such a mismatch between what I was doing in class, if you will, versus what I was being tested on. And now I'll leave it to Moses to talk about some of the more subtle differences. Absolutely. And, and this table really highlights a lot of the things that Michael was talking about. I'll point out a few of the ways in which uh, step two can be a little bit of a challenge, as well as some ways in which you can leverage your experience, um, both taking step one. Um, so you're coming in armed with that experience, uh, but also just your growing experience clinically. So with step one, I think that there's a uh, short of some very specific scenarios. It's very clear which resources our highest yield and, and so-called must have resources. Whereas for step two CK, often you need to be a little bit more thoughtful about which resources you can and should use because there is just an ocean of resources out there that you could theoretically use. And it's easy to sort of get overwhelmed. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but just file that in the back of your mind. That's one of the big differences that folks have to contend with uh, when it comes to, to step two CK. Um, some of you will be happy to know that there is a de-emphasis of some of the really nitty gritty um, pathways, the biochem, the exact uh, reactants and, and sort of the biochemistry. I'm not saying some of these basic science concepts uh, can't come up because they certainly can, but the focus is far more as the name of the test implies a clinical focus and how the basic science really informs uh, the clinical side of things. Of course, as Michael was just saying, and I won't belabor it, you are just in a different place in your medical training when it comes to step two CK. Uh, specifically, you might have other clinical responsibilities, whether it be electives or other uh, things that your med school has you doing. Um, you've also been through a lot uh, in the classical curriculum. Uh, you've been through a, a clerkship year, maybe a few electives, certainly that arms you with a lot of knowledge, but it's also easy to burn out. And so it's important to really keep that in mind and build into your schedule very intentionally ways to keep yourself feeling mentally fresh um, and ready to, to really attack this, this new exam. On the plus side, you are now entering more and more the, the medical profession. So some of these things are clinical issues and decision-making uh, sort of uh, branch points that you've seen in the lives of actual patients you've taken care of. Um, in contrast to step one, uh, you often won't have uh, the opportunity to make multiple passes through the material. But again, linking that back to clinically, you have been essentially going through this material for the better part of a year plus. Um, and that will do you good in terms of your actual preparation. Um, Michael, talk a little bit about the things that you absolutely have to know for step two CK. Yeah, that first word, just you have to know everything. I think that's the, the no, I, there's some, some tips and tricks, I think, on some things that are particularly worth your attention. Um, medicine is going to be the vast, vast majority of the exam. Um, and as it's probably going to be the vast majority of most of your clerkship time, um, it's going to be your longest shelf. It's going to be kind of the, the most dominant aspect of your, your step two CK preparation. Within medicine, um, you can break it down by organ system and sort of pick the one or two conditions from each. I think if you're thinking cardiology, heart failure, and ACS are going to be ones that you're going to see. You can move into pulmonology, COPD and pneumonia, um, renal. You know, I mean, I, I like to think of all of the, the homeostasis sort of organ systems you're going to see endocrine neurology. So everything that you're kind of used to um, from step one in terms of the overall diseases that you just had to identify and name, you're now going to have to know a little bit more about their diagnostic processes and their management. Um, I wouldn't expect to find a whole new slew of diseases on step two. I think there's maybe a couple that you, you didn't learn for step one that you'll have to do, but it's not going to be a, a big amount. Um, for me, right, being very medicine-minded, one of the harder things for me was sort of the surgical, right, so the OBGYN and the surgery questions. Um, when it comes to surgery, less about sort of uh, surgeries themselves, but more about indications for who needs to go to the operating room, um, who's stable to have further testing, who's stable to have a medical management. Um, let's say trauma is very, very highly represented on UWorld, and that's going to be kind of a predominant 
aspects of surgery that you're going to learn. Peds, you're going to be revisited by all of the rashes and infectious peds syndromes that, that you had to know for step one. Those are going to come back um, in the form of the pediatric shelf as well as some of the milestones that you learned uh, for psychiatry. And so I think there's going to be a lot of revisiting things. I don't want you to feel like this is all going to be new stuff to you. Um, common orthopedic injuries. I think I remember so many questions about evaluating hip pain in a child. That's like the one thing that was burned into my memory from, from peds and then step two. And I was like, keep going with the other ones. And then, or you, you can tell us about, there we go. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, you know, Ashka Slaughters, I know nothing about pediatrics at this point being so far away, but that, that name is just forever seared in my memory. And really going along with what you said, um, again, as an internist and an aspiring oncologist, I don't spend a lot of time in my day-to-day -day, uh, thinking about OB-GYN um, and psychiatry, although all of these fields are, are largely intersecting, and that's why it's important for every med student to know. But again, what is particularly high yield? My general framework is thinking about, and this applies across all specialties, what, are, what is epidemiologically very common such that most people are going to encounter this regardless of what field they go into? And secondly, what is particularly morbid, right? If that, that really frames how I think about what shows up on these exams. So for OB-GYN, it really follows that pattern. You're thinking about preeclampsia. Obviously, it can have devastating uh, implications if it advances uh, for mother and fetus. Um, thinking about the intersections, again, between internal medicine and OB-GYN, thinking about some of the endocrinological issues that can uh, have an OB-GYN focus. Um, and again, close to my heart, but gynecologic malignancies, as well as benign tumors, particularly as you can start getting a little bit of a flavor of basic science and pathology in there. Don't be surprised if, again, it, it will not be the predominant uh, question type, but some of these things can pop up. For psychiatry, just like hip pain in the child uh, is something that comes up frequently, knowing the different criteria within psychiatry for the various disorders, especially the closely related ones, is really important because this is one way in which the test writers can try to trip you up, right? Knowing the difference between um, a brief psychotic episode and schizophrenia and schizoaffective, what makes these different syndromes differently when it comes to their diagnostic DSM criteria is really high yield. And then all of the pharmacology, just because again, going back to that framework, really common and morbid. Here, there's a lot of folks who are on SSRIs, for instance, various medications for anxiety. And so having a good grasp of that pharmacology is really, really important. Important. And, and the biostats and epi really is a carryover from step one because they're really going to be testing study design, um, outcome measures, um, and then some of the more ethical concerns, which can be a challenge for some students because there can be a little bit of a gray area. There's always a right answer, or a, I should say a best answer, um, but really getting practice, again, going back to some of the resources we'll touch on in a moment, um, to practice some of these ethical scenarios um, can just make you feel a little bit more comfortable about that particular subject matter. So in terms of establishing a plan, Michael, mind uh, talking to us about some of the resources that folks might consider using? Yeah, this is one of the most sort of um, heartwarming is the wrong word, but it's actually the word that came to my mind part about sitting down and studying for step two myself was that I didn't feel pulled in like 50 million directions and that I didn't need to buy all of these things and people, I, I sort of had my home base and that was that I could make a pass or two through UWorld and feel pretty confident that that was going to serve me well in the exam and then lean on some other things as I needed them moving forward. But really my core study plan just had to center on UWorld. And that's true, I think, of exactly how I advise almost every student I've ever tutored, and Moses is shaking his head, because I think um, you really, really can center on UWorld for this test, and I think making a pass through UWorld, and then using some of these other books that we referenced, and there's a whole, you know what I mean, there's another subset on the next page, um, to augment your learning with some particular diseases. I think, like, hey, I missed a question today on ACS, I'm a little less familiar with that than I should be. Um, moving into the step up to medicine, reading the two or three pages of that book dedicated to ACS is sort of, I think, the really golden way of, of preparing for this exam, not sitting down with step up to medicine and saying, I'm going to make a cover to cover read through this book, and then I'm going to be good. This is all about applying your knowledge, and so I think question banks should be where you start. 
I couldn't agree more. Um, you mentioned some of these supplemental resources and some of which you can see on the slide here right now. What I would really emphasize is something that Michael said, which was know where your weaknesses are. And those weaknesses could be pre-existing weaknesses. Perhaps you had a clerkship that you particularly struggled with or a shelf uh, that felt more difficult than the others. Maybe it's in the process of studying. You notice that you tend to get uh, you know, SSRI questions wrong or pharmacology questions wrong, or like me, maybe you weren't the most comfortable with um, PEDS or with ob -GYN. And so you start out thinking, how am I going to address these knowledge gaps by using some of these supplemental resources? I do want to emphasize the point that they are supplemental. It's just like Michael was saying, you can't spend 80% of your time with these and neglect what really should be the cornerstone of your preparation, which is active practice in the form of UWorld and the resources mentioned on the other screen. This is just a visual depiction of what Moses and I said. So start at point one, um, if the UWorld explanation isn't cutting it for you and sort of, I think that sometimes I say when these are totally unfamiliar to you based on the question. Um, and it's not just a simple fact that you missed, that's sort of my, internal signal that I need to go study that disease a little bit more. And that might be when I open up one of these supplementary resources and look in there. And then I also think that sort of maybe to correct a holdover behavior that some of you may have from step one is if you remember, right, sketchy path, path Doma, boards and beyond, and UWorld may have all had different information that you quote unquote needed to know. Um, I really encourage you for step two to just pick one. Don't feel like, oh, I read the book to medicine, but then also sketchy I am has like a little bit extra on this. I think you should really just kind of choose one. That's going to be the place you go when you need a little bit more. Absolutely. So that brings us then to developing the study plan because the first step is to identify the resources that you're going to use, really focusing on the high yield. But equally important is how do you put them together in a way that is comprehensive, uh, that fits with what else is going on with your life, and that will get you to your goal. So the, on the screen are really some uh, seemingly obvious questions that, that you should really be thinking through when coming up with a study plan. So the first is how much time are you going to have to study and what other demands on your time? I've worked with students um, who run the gamut from I have no other responsibilities and I have you know incredible flexibility when it comes to when I can take the exam. And I've worked with other students who say, you know, um, because of the logistics of electives, of applications, of all of these other things, I really have this very well-defined period of time that I need to capitalize and sort of nail on the first attempt. Otherwise, it would sort of complicate um, the overall trajectory through medical school. Some folks have family responsibilities, kids, you know, folks are coming to medicine uh, in a really nice way from a, a wide variety of backgrounds. And so sort of having an understanding of what timeline you're going to be on, what other responsibilities you should be aware of, and how everything is going to fit together. We already talked about organizing and picking your resources in a sort of tiered manner. And le leading from that into making a task list, and that really boils down to making a calendar for yourself. And I think having that accountability with yourself, with a partner, with a tutor, with whoever it is, um, about making a calendar, sticking to it as best as you can, um, and being very sort of mathematical about how you do that. So thinking I have X number of questions to do over Y period of time, let me do a little bit of math about how many questions I need to be doing per day, thinking about building in some buffer. We're all human, no one can follow a calendar uh, to, with perfection. Um, and so understanding that, having a little bit of uh, grace and forgiveness for yourself when things don't go exactly as planned, but also having some anticipatory guidance for yourself about um, what you're gonna do if things fall a little bit behind, or if you find that you need to pivot um, and focus on another area as you learn more and more about uh, how you're doing and on track to your goal, which is really point six. And I really want to emphasize this point, it's assessment and reassessment of your plan, you know, every week sitting down with yourself or with whoever uh, is, is helping you stay accountable and asking what worked well in the past week? Um, how did I structure my days? Do I need to change anything in the week to come to make sure that I'm staying on track? <laughs> 
And I think now we're really going to shift to uh, talking more about question strategies. I do want to point out that there may be a lot of questions that are bubbling up uh, in, in the crowd about, well, how does this apply to me specifically? And it, we'll attempt to get at some of the general points later on in the Q&A. Um, but we also want to emphasize that it's impossible to sort of sort out everyone's specific situation um, during a webinar. And we'd, we'd love to hear from you. But with that, um, I'll turn it over to Michael to talk about some common question themes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think these are some of the points that are going to feel a little bit different to you um, based on your sort of your step one or your level one question. So a lot of these next best step questions, and we'll try and go through them uh, in the four that we're going to present. We'll talk about how the, the next best step freezing works. But um, what do I do next for this person? Do I need to diagnose them or do I move straight to intervention? Um, is it something that I can do or is it something that has to go to a specialist? And then um, what is the first line treatment for this person? Is it a medication for a little bit or is it surgery? Um, the example that I always use when I'm talking to students about this is Alzheimer's disease. If I ask you for the next best step in diagnosis of someone who you suspect to have Alzheimer's disease, uh, versus the gold standard for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. The next best step is probably gonna be something like neuropsychologic testing. Uh, the gold standard diagnosis is an autopsy, right? So be careful about how the questions are worded to you because those are wildly different things. Um, the best diagnostic tool, right? So what is indicated for this person who I have this suspicion? So I kind of give you a, a little bit of an example there. So it's often, the most cost-effective and the least invasive, but not always. Sometimes you can't wait for a non-invasive test because you should jump to an invasive test and confirm your diagnosis because there's risk involved if you don't. Um, most likely you're gonna get some things that are gonna feel a little more bread and butter to you. Hey, given this clinical story, what's the most likely diagnosis? Can you diagnose this based off this image? Um, same as that most likely complication. Uh, I have a person who is living with HIV and XYZ, what is the most likely complication of you know, I mean, their non-adherence to their antiretroviral therapy with this specific organ system, I think, is, is sort of how you can start to think about things. Um, I love epidemiology, so, so sometimes I think I can look at a question and they can give me the age of the person to the general condition, and I can probably tell you with a reasonable certainty what the answer is going to be just based on what's the most likely. Um, same with the most common risk factor. I think everything I remember from about OBGYN is the most likely risk factor for something happening is that it happened before in a previous pregnancy. That's the one that I, I remember wholeheartedly. Um, and then you're not gonna escape some of the basic sciences, right? I was asked the mechanism of action of rifampin on my step two exam and thought I was sort of done with that. But um, they do come back a little bit in, in less high quality quantity. Was there anything else you would add? No, I, I think what I would add really can be summarized on this uh, on this slide. Um, and it really harkens back to what I was saying when coming up with a, a strategy and a schedule for yourself. Um, you know, you've at this point taking uh, a number of these exams. And so I would um, rest assured that you sort of know yourself. Um, so having that spirit of introspection um, and really trying to address any concerns that came up with prior exams or not reinventing the wheel. If something has worked for you in the past, now is probably not the time to totally change your study schedule. Do keep in mind things like timing issues in the past. That might be something you want to start addressing right up front. Um, we already talked about if there's a particular topic or subject area that just perennially plagues you, um, that might be something to uh, recognize and, and plan address to address early on. Um, some of these tips also seem very obvious, but it's surprising how often I and, and my students get tripped up really having a, a very clear and specific sense of what exactly is being asked. Michael sort of alluded to this earlier, right? Um, subtle changes in wording can dramatically change um, what the correct answer is for a particular vignette. Is it the most likely diagnosis or the most morbid diagnosis? Is it the next best test or is it the gold standard test? These are very different things. <laughs> 
Um, general tips. Um, you'll find your style when it comes to highlighting. Some folks highlight everything. Some folks never highlight. Um, again, what works for you? What gets you to the right answer is the approach that you should take. In general, I say highlight abnormalities and key like epidemiologic things in the, in the first couple of lines. And I also advocate for highlighting the actual question because it really forces you to look at that question back to point number one. What is it that they're actually asking? The last two points are not specific to step two CK in, in really any, any sense, but it bears repeating that you want to practice and train yourself in an environment that as closely mirrors exam day as possible. Now, does that need to be 100% of the time? Not necessarily, but you want to walk into your exam feeling comfortable about the interface, about the timing, about the endurance that is needed. Don't wear yourself out. But these are things that you don't want to be surprised on your exam day. And I, we've mentioned this several times already, but make time for wellness. I remember working with a student who, um, you know, felt that they could simply not afford a half day or a day off to rest. And when we started working together, I really insisted upon it. And the st score started improving because this person now felt rested. There was a little bit more excitement. They had time to reconnect with, um, with their loved ones. And sometimes these things are subtle, but they can, uh, or they seem like they're not as big a deal, as, particularly when a high stakes exam is coming up, but often they can make all the difference. Any other high level uh, recommendations for, for folks, Michael? No, I think the last point you made is probably amongst my favorite that will make this entire presentation. I think I typically say to people, and you might have different numbers in your head, and is that a study schedule can really be like a six day a week, like eight to 10 hour a day for pretty much anyone. And that works, right? Even if you're someone who's aspiring to, to insanely high scores. So it's all about efficiency. So if you find yourself sort of clamoring in like the oh man, I'm studying seven days a week, 16 hours. I think I would just encourage all of you to say, hey, I'm a really good student. This is working for me. I'm highly successful. Maybe I should have someone help me with a little bit of efficiency. Um, so that, that's my, my last point about wellness is sort of know what that upper limit looks like. Totally agree. All right, Michael, I think you've got questions one and two, and then I'll take the last few. Uh, yeah. Take it away. Yes, this is exactly what everyone wanted. The neurologist teaching them nephrology, right? These are, this is the mistaken consult gone to fruition. So you thought you were paging nephrology, but you got neurology instead. So here we go. Um, this is a 41 year old gentleman who presents to the ED for general malaise, right? I love the first question. I, it usually helps frame me um, and sort of who I'm thinking about, what their risk factors are, X, Y, Z. This is really vague. I'm, I have to keep reading for more information. I see that I have an image I'm the type of test taker and the way I typically say is I don't use the image until I need it, right? Um, because I think sometimes people can get tripped up by images. If you are a pathology expert and you're a future pathologist and you can look at this and you can tell me what disease this is, by all means, I'm not that person. I need more information to sort of help myself not get tripped up by the image. He's noticed swelling of his face, hands, and scrotum, as well as uncharacteristic uncharacteristically foamy urine. So I have some buzzwords in there. Does anyone want to type in the chat sort of what condition I'm thinking of in general, what umbrella condition? The foamy urine and widespread swelling. So about five more seconds. So no worry, you could be like, Michael, I don't really know what is doing that. Swelling can come from people's kidneys. It can come from people's livers. It can come from people's stomachs. So like the OCs, gastrosis, nephrosis, cirrhosis, right? All of those things can cause people to swell. Um, I need more information. So I don't have any past medical history, unfortunately. He does not use tobacco. He drinks two to three beers on the weekend. So it doesn't meet criteria for alcohol use disorder. So I don't have to use that as a risk factor as I keep thinking. He's currently homeless. Um, 24 hour urine collection reveals 4.5 grams of protein per day. That itself should be diagnostic for me. Good, yeah, so I have a couple people in the chat. So we have nephrotic disease, we have glomerular arthritis. So even earlier, if I was thinking, oh, this person's swollen because they have cirrhosis, this sentence has now steered me towards kidney, right? So they've told me that his urine meets 
uh, criteria for nephrotic range proteinuria, and I can go ahead and say, okay, I'm, I think I'm dealing with a nephrotic syndrome here. Uh, renal biopsy is performed. There we go. We definitely are, are in the right place. We're working with the kidney, and the results are below as obtained, which of the following is a predisposing factor for this patient's condition. Okay, so I still am not comfortable with the imaging to go ahead and say, I know exactly what this is, right? I can look at that image, kind of it's pink and purple, and, and that's what I get out of it. But what I can do is sort of leverage the things I do know to help me navigate and negotiate this question. So I have a middle-aged man, right? I, I'm mentioning epidemiology. Um, I know the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults is focal segmental glomerulonosclerosis. I know that that tends to be more common in patients um, of who are Hispanic or black. And then I know the most common cause in adults of Caucasian or that they tend to have membranous nephropathy. So I sort of have that fact in my mind from studying epidemiologically and I can approach the whole rest of the question that way. Um, another thing that I might encourage you all to do is look at the answer choices and see which one of them match with things that you think should have a biopsy picture, right? I have heard about captopril causing renal injury, right? I've never heard about captopril causing uh, a glomerulonephritis or a nephrotic syndrome. And even still, if I'm thinking about how captopril damages the kidney, right, I cause a hypoperfusion. I like release angiotensin's effect. I hypoperfuse. I don't know what that would look like on a renal biopsy, right? I don't have a specific pathology. Um, Hypertensive emergency, I sort of recognize as something that causes a nephritic syndrome in my mind, right? I would expect a different presentation of the patient. I also remember sort of the whole like crescent glomerulonephritis is sort of something that is it's always more dangerous, right? It happens with polyangiitis with granulomatosis or hypertension. So I'm skipping the middle three because I remember that all of those have something to do with something and I'm going to come back to them. And then poorly treated diabetes. I think uh, in my mind, right, poorly treated diabetes can cause a nephrotic syndrome. I tend to think of it more of mixed, but I'm not gonna hang my hat on that knowledge. But I do remember sort of, then I remember like the pathognomonic renal biopsy finding for poorly treated diabetes. This person is out of medical care, so they have a reason to have poorly controlled disease. And I tend to remember sort of like the idea of everything getting like, yeah, good, Elizabeth, Kimmelstone Wilson's nodule. So I want like big pink circular nodules and I want the dangial expansion and I want all of those things that, that tend to be described. So going back to earlier, um, I don't think this question gives me a lot. This is one where I think this makes people uncomfortable because they say the question's too vague. How are they supposed to know what this is the answer? Going back to my earlier point, epidemiologically, I think the most likely answer is FSGS. Right, I have really nothing else in, in the question stem to steer me in another direction. I have no really key risk factors. They, they do mention the person is unhoused, but that, that can mean a whole lot of things. Um, and so I, I think if I went forward, I could probably convince myself that I see some focal and only in certain parts of the biopsy segmental um, sclerosis or, or irregular pink stuff. Um, I think that I could convince myself that that picture what I would encourage you all to do is that the picture does not directly support or refute what you're thinking in your mind with, a, with absolute certainty, try to not use it, right? Try to not let it cloud your memory. Cause I think that's where you sort of get into the, oh, I can convince myself that it's this. So with that in mind, Moses, I remember that FSGS is associated with HIV. I remember that it's associated with heroin use, morbid obesity, um, my list is sort of going down in my mind. Hep C tends to be associated with membranous nephropathy. So I do know that that's sort of the most likely detractor. And I, in my mind, don't really have a great mechanism for hepatitis B causing direct renal injury. So that's how I go through each of the answer choices. And just to summarize, I think that this answer choice is HIV because I think this person has FSGS based on their clinical presentation of nephrotic syndrome. That was awesome. Um, I just might add one more thing before we move on, and that is to go, you beautifully went forwards, I'll go backwards. So, and I, and I really want to highlight high level sort of test taking strategies. So first, if you read the question, which of the following is a predisposing factor for this patient's condition, 
Just reading that sentence tells me a couple of things. One, I'm going to have to make a diagnosis at some point in this question vignette. They're not going to give it to me, right? What is this condition is essentially the question. Two, I'm learning that this is a second, maybe third order question, right? I need to first make a diagnosis, and then I need to know something about that diagnosis. In this case, it's some risk factor for that particular disease. And the reason I highlight it like that is because once I frame the question in that way, I have to make a diagnosis and then know something about that diagnosis. It changes the way I read the question. I start then by saying, this is a middle-aged person. Michael loves epidemiology. I'm on that bandwagon. This is middle, middle-aged, right? And then I'm not going to add to, to the phenomenal discussion um, that you had, Michael, because you went through all of the answer choices perfectly. Um, I'll note that some of the hepatitis are also associated with like mixed cryoglobulinemia, and they can have a bunch of protein manifestations, but um, that's, that's sort of beside the point. Um, the key thing is to put yourself in the right mind space. What is it that I'm attempting to do? Now, if, if this question had given us the diagnosis, well, then I'm not going to spend the mental energy to try to figure out. I'm not even going to worry about the image that much because I sort of know what it's there for already. Um, so that would be the only thing that, that I would add. Thoughts on that, Michael? No, that's perfect. I think you, uh, I would say, and I'm happy to, I'll, I'll show people what I mean. I, I typically, in the next question, I typically myself read the first line and the last two lines to do exactly what you said, which is to sort of say, what am I dealing with here? Sometimes for step two, I think that I often find that I have to read the whole question to get all the info because they sort of learned that, of, of how I like to, to skip around and take test taking trips. But. 100. And in that spirit, here you go. Great. Um, and I actually will pause before I start. Kara, your question, why did I decide FSGS over membranous nephropathy? So I sort of, um, and Moses, if you don't mind going back to the image, membranous nephropathy, again, I don't remember enough to be a pathologist to pick it out, but I do remember that it sort of just causes like the really dense appearing sort of loops, the copper, like the wire loop. I don't even remember all the words for it, right? But sort of just encircles things and less with the, um, extra pink in the middle, right? So sort of the mesangial expansion. So I think if I was trying to make a really hard pressed decision between FSGS and membranous nephropathy, the picture was helpful for me. But looking at the picture to make a diagnosis was was over my head, if that makes sense. So use it only to answer questions that you're you're capable of using it for. And what I'll add here is, imagine that you never had this image in the first place. Could you make an educated guess based on the vignette on in isolation. And I will pause here to just make a point and say that, you know, these exams often rely on buzzwords, on epidemiological factors, and we have to remember not to stereotype people based on their background or their behaviors. But for the purposes of the exam, there is an element of uh, picking up buzzwords. So in this person, we know that they've had struggles in terms of their housing. We know that there is some history of um, uh, tobacco use and, and alcohol use. And so could you imagine a picture in which um, this person might uh, use IV uh, drugs, potentially, right? Now, it's dangerous to read too much into a vignette, and you can definitely go too far and start inventing data that the writers never intended you to read into the question. So this is the art of doing thousands of year old questions to figure out that balance. And the reason there is a picture here is because I don't think it would be fair to have you make those leaps without the additional little bit of information to really push you past the finish line for FSGS. But if you must, and you're absolutely lost, you can try to make these vague connections with the understanding that you're extending beyond what the test writers are doing. And, it, and you should be able to construct a really logical, complete argument for an answer that doesn't rely on sort of these extrapolations. But if you have to, it's there. Okay. So I mentioned before that I like to know kind of what, especially when I'm met with this, this wall of text, right? So a uh, 56 year old black male comes to the clinic complaining of cough and trouble sleeping over the past six weeks. Um, so I think from a couple of things I can establish again, sort of the type of patient that I'm seeing, right? So I'm seeing someone in middle aged. I have a chief complaint. So I have cough and trouble sleeping. 
And then I have a time course, right? I have a tempo, right? So this is something that's been happening for six weeks. So this is not, you know what I mean? I think in terms of my diseases that are gonna, right? So I guess, not talking too much, but like bacterial pneumonia can cause a cough, right? But bacterial pneumonia tends to be a more rapid onset over the course of a couple of days. So I think the way that I am thinking about which diseases can cause subacute or chronic cough um, will also help me as I move forward. And then I always feel like the last line and then the question give me, the last two lines give me all the information that I need uh, to sort of think further. So a TTE shows that he has a EF of 45%, which is pretty borderline for me. It's not quite heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It's not quite a normal EF. I think this person's gonna have some sort of cardiac etiology to their cough, right? Until I'm proven wrong in the question. So if they give me something in the question that, that tells me definitively not their heart, then I'll, I'll readjust, but I'm gonna read this question and then I really wanna know what the next first step in management of this patient's condition. And I have some diagnostic procedures, some therapeutics, um, or to do nothing. And so to Moses's point before, I now can read through this wall of text saying, I need to make a diagnosis. I, I'm, I'm suspicious for a cardiac cause of cough and they wanna know what I wanna do about it. You know, this is something that needs immediate management with like a heart cath. Or do I want to start with a medicine? And it makes your life a whole lot easier when you try and read through this wall of text, really trying to only answer those. Be super, super careful though not to answer, right? So I do really like the phrasing, hey, I think this person has a cardiac cause of cough until I'm proven wrong, right? So look through the rest of the vignette for things that prove me right or prove me wrong, and then I'll approach the question from there. So his exercise tolerance has decreased recently. That doesn't help me with heart or lung. He used to be able to walk eight blocks but now it's some short of breath and that same interval. He has a cough that's productive of minimal clear sputum that's worse with exertion and lying down. Okay, so cough that's productive actually doesn't really help me separate heart and lung either. He endorses shortness of breath while lying flat at night. So he has orthopnea that is relieved by putting pillows underneath his head. That to me sort of gives me more of a congestive pulmonary edema cardiogenic pulmonary edema type picture. Um, doesn't 100% prove me right, but pretty good evidence, right? It tilts my scales much more towards heart. He denies chest pain, fever, or wheezing. His past medical history is noted for coronary artery disease, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. Okay, I think we often ignore within patients' past medical history, right? I'm thinking about what I know about heart failure. I think about like sort of the most likely things that lead to heart failure. Coronary artery disease is actually a huge risk factor for the subsequent development of heart failure. So I, I want you to kind of think of it like that. It's meaningful that they gave me this in his medical history, right? I think we often think that people just have hypertension and diabetes in their medical history. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes when they give you a little bit extra, when they name medicines and they name other conditions, I often take pause and, and really think about them. He's on metoprolol, atorvastatin, and metformin. Okay. So pretty good medication regimen, given what I know about him right now. He's got history of coronary artery disease, hypertension doesn't really seem to be treated, maybe the metoprolol, but anyway, vitals include temperature, it's normal, pulse is normal, blood pressure is a little high, respiratory rate is fine, um, on the higher end, but fine. On physical exam, his neuro exam is intact. Okay, so he has no murmurs or gallops. So this is where we start to know, hey, what does my physical exam do? How does it help me? Are these things rule out conditions or do they rule in conditions? Um, so I, if I'm thinking heart failure, does the absence of an S3 gallop rule out heart failure, right? Just prove me wrong. This person does not have an S3, so they can't have heart failure. Does anyone approach the question that way? No one's falling for my bait. Yeah, so I think, I think a lot of students get tripped up by this because they're used to someone giving you this beautiful package of what heart failure looks like and saying, here's an S3 gallop, here's orthopnea, here's, you know what I mean? two plus fitting edema in the lower extremities. Here's everything that you want, JVD. They're not gonna do that. Um, I think in this exact instance, right, the absence of an S3 or an S4 doesn't really rule out heart failure in this case. Um, he's got mild by Basler inspiratory crackle. Um, EKG shows me LVH, and then I have the TTE finding. Um, and so I, I'm still with my sort of clinical picture of orthopnea, untreated hypertension, um, sort of a preserved, if you will, EF or a minimally reduced EF, depending on how fancy you want to get. Um, 
I, I think my diagnosis is heart failure here. And then thinking, do I need to do a cardiac catheterization for heart failure to diagnose it? No. Um, do I want to initiate treatment with nitroglycerin? Um, that typically doesn't fall in my list of medicines that has a mortality benefit in heart failure. I think if someone was coming in and was a little more unstable and I wanted to sort of immediately offload their heart a little bit, I might think about that where they had chest pain. I might think about nitroglycerin, but not really for chronic management of heart failure. Um, and allopril, an ACE inhibitor, sort of does check my boxes. It falls in, in the list of medicines that could be one for no other reason than fixing his hypertension. I would love to put it on an allopril, right? But it also is going to have a mortality benefit for him in heart failure. Uh, discontinue a torvastatin. I have no reason to do that in someone who's ever had coronary artery disease in the past. And then no change is necessary. I'd be hard pressed to do nothing for this gentleman who's had a troublesome cough that's keeping him up at the night. So that's sort of how I would go through it. Um, Moses, yeah. So when they want you to think of someone truly having, uh, so Moses put a, a great point in the chat with one person, but I'll, I'll make it aloud. Um, if I really, really want someone, and I think me as a question writer or tutor, to really think about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, I give them the number 35% or below, right? So I think some of these middle range numbers and the normal tends to be over 50. So sort of this 40 to 50 is, is, a, is a more ambiguous and it actually is clinically too a more ambiguous area and sort of how you treat this person's heart. Um, in any instance, and I think clinically this is true and uh, testing will lag behind, but we sort of just think goal-directed medical therapy, right? So the medicines that make people live longer with heart failure pretty good for almost anyone with heart failure, right? So we think of it best for people with reduced ejection fraction um, or systolic heart failure. And then we're starting to think about it way, way more for people with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure. So my answer is C, initiate treatment with enalapril for hypertension management, but more for heart failure. And that's my diagnosis. Beautiful. I have nothing to add. My favorite thing to say on rounds, nothing to add. Um, the best part about being a senior is hearing everything and just being like, I got nothing. Good job. Just the, the thumbs up. Um, awesome. If folks don't have questions about this, we have a couple other questions to go through. We'll be mindful of everyone's time, but I think it's useful to highlight some of these uh, test-taking strategies. Um, and with that, I'll move to, to this problem that does include uh, a radiographic image. Um, and so I will, I will illustrate, well, I'll do a couple of things. One, I'll, I'll illustrate my approach to answering these questions. Everyone's approach is slightly different. So, um, you know, pick the one that works for you and that's systematic. Um, and then along the way, I'll pause after every sentence, just like Michael was doing and share some of my thoughts. So here, the last sentence reads, which of the following is the most likely organism responsible for this patient's current symptoms? Now, reading the last sentence here is really helpful because I've already reduced the list of possible diagnostic entities from the space of everything that can afflict a person to essentially ID things, right? And I noticed that most of these are bacteria, like I'm not seeing, um, uh, you know, really uh, endemic fungi among the list of answers. It's really helped me narrow down. And as I read the rest of this vignette, I'm thinking, can I, how can I be as specific as possible about um, this diagnosis? And can I link that to a particular uh, bacterium or, or I should say organism? Uh, so we started by reading a 37 year old man presents to the emergency department with four days of fever, chills and cough productive of white sputum. And again, I really like this concept of the illness script which is the distillation of a case to its most salient features that um, points in the direction of what you think is the most likely diagnosis. And so I will be uh, highlighting that process um, and starting by saying that this is a middle-aged individual presenting with a subacute inflammatory pulmonary syndrome, right? And if I wanted to really put my chips down, I could say a, middle, uh, a young to middle-aged um, gentleman with subacute uh, pneumonia-like syndrome, right? Because the fever gives me the inflammation. The fever and chills really give me the inflammation piece of that. And of course, inflammation can be more than infectious. But remember, I already read the last sentence. I know that it's something infectious. So I'm, I'm linking that to an inflammatory infectious process. And then the cough with uh, white sputum production um, clues me in that the site of inflammation is the pulmonary system. So then I also read the next sentence. He also complains of sharp right-sided chest pain when he takes a deep breath. Now, I do think it's important to convert what you're reading 
into more clinical language and that can help you. So here, when I, I take that second sentence and I distill it down to pleuritic chest pain, right? And we know the pleurisy can be caused by a number of different things. So we'll have to read on, but uh, you know, PE can cause pleuritic chest pain. Um, some of the musculoskeletal pathology of the rib cage, um, costochondritis can lead to pleuritic chest pain, but I'm putting together a pulmonary process with pleuritic chest pain subacute. So that's the foreground. That's what's happening. That's bringing this person into the hospital. And now I'm going to layer that foreground on top of the background of what else is going on with him medically. We learned that his past medical history is significant for HIV, which was diagnosed 10 years ago. So he has chronic HIV. The patient is on highly active antiretroviral therapy, but reports he occasionally misses doses. So alarm bells are now going off in my mind because this is transformed from a young adult man with subacute inflammatory pulmonary syndrome suggestive of pneumonia to potentially an immunocompromised young to middle-aged adult man with the same syndrome. And one of the things I really wanna highlight here is that when someone is immunocompromised, it's not that the spectrum of possible diagnostic etiologies shifts, which is easy to think about because we're often tested on the opportunistic infections, but it's rather that the diagnostic space expands. They're, they can, they're still liable to get any of the uh, diseases that non-immunocompromised individuals get, um, but they're also now vulnerable to a broader array of uh, complications. And like with any patient with HIV, the next sentence gives us um, one of the most important pieces of information, which is that his last CD4 cell count was 200 three months ago. So again, it's confirming the immunosuppression, um, but it also helps us quantify it or maybe qualify it. We can bucket this, right? It's not above 500. It's not a thousand plus, um, which would be a fully immunocompetent or, or close to fully immunocompetent individual, but it's also not 10, um, which would really put this individual at risk for a very broad range of infectious organisms. We learn he's had oral thrush consistent with immunocompromise in the past, but no other opportunistic infection. So again, I'm, I'm putting this person in sort of the moderate immunosuppressed category. And it's important to start qualifying it in that way. We get some uh, social history here with the tobacco, uh, no uh, tobacco, alcohol, or illicit uh, drugs. His temperature is 38.6. So here's another flashpoint, really highlighting the inflammatory component here. This is frank fever. His blood pressure is a little bit low. His pulse is high normal. Respirations are within normal range at 18. And his pulse ox is 98. So I'll pause here and say that like on the scale of yeah, whatever, this person's like sick, but it's like, we'll figure it out to this person needs an ICU because they're super, super sick. I'm starting to become a little bit more worried about this person. Their blood pressure isn't quite uh, where I'd like it to be. They have a, a, a real deal fever, right? So if I were to reframe my illness script um, for this particular case, it would be a young, an immunocompromised, mildly to moderately immunocompromised uh, young adult man presenting with subacute a pleuritic chest pain, fevers, um, and uh, and a syndrome consistent with pneumonia, who is who is moderately ill. Um, I really love what Michael said about highlighting, um, really highlighting the ways in which the physical exam and other data can help rule in or rule things out. So here on the exam, I'm I'm asking myself. Will I see evidence of a pneumonia? Because that's my leading hypothesis right now that this person has a pneumonia of some sort. So I hear coarse crackles and dullness to percussion and increased tactile fremitus over the right lower lung field, which it does. It, it does reinforce that there's a focal process happening in the lung in a particular lobe. The next sentence is one which sometimes uh, can freak students out because it's like, oh my goodness, I'm not a radiologist. I have to look at this imaging. I find it really important that before I click that little button or before I really study an image, I ask myself, what, am, what is this image gonna tell me? What am I looking for in this image, right? If my leading suspicion is for some sort of infectious process within the thorax, then I'm gonna be asking myself, do I see 
a low bar pneumonia? Do I see um, evidence of volume that would refute my, my hypothesis of a pneumonia? Would I see cardiomegaly that would really shake things up and make me think there's something going on in the heart? Um, that's the, my mind frame going in. I'm, I, it's a hypothesis testing tool. Each test is a hypothesis testing tool. So if we look over to the right of the screen and we look at the image, I'm just going to pop open uh, the chat here. And I'd love for you all, I know you're not all radiologists, neither am I, but what do you see here? Just type, um, you don't have to use fancy language. What are you seeing in this chest x-ray? And I'll give you all uh, 10 or 15 seconds here. I love it. Some folks are pointing out that there's something going on on that right side, which is nice because it correlates to our physical exam. You know, the, the organized approach that I have to imaging, so please keep on putting stuff in the chat. I'll just talk while, while the answers roll in. Appreciate those who are, who are participating. Um, the organized approach I have is look at the airway. Is it midline? Looking at the bones, is there any uh, major fracture, dislocation, or other issue there? Looking at the cardiac silhouette, is it enlarged? Um, which could suggest either that the myocardium is somehow abnormal um, or that there's an effusion or something else that makes the silhouette appear larger. Um, I look at the diaphragms looking for effusions. I want them to be nice and crisp, those costophrenic angles. Um, and then I'm looking at E for either everything else, E for effusions, or if we keep going down, I could say F for fields. And that's where I pause because there's a glaring abnormality here as folks are pointing out in the chat. Thank you so much for participating. There is too much white hazy stuff in the right lobe, right? And it's it's either the uh, right middle or right lower lobe, but either way, there's a, there's a low bar pneumonia and it has sort of confirmed uh, my suspicion. And now we return back to the question. And here's another tip that I have is to reread the question in light of everything that you've already read. So which of the following is the most likely organism responsible for this patient's current symptoms? And so it, it's at this point that I reframe uh, the whole vignette and I say that this person, I think, has a low bar pneumonia who's immunocompromised. So now I turn it back to the chat. Low bar pneumonia, what is the most Name a, a common organism that leads to low bar pneumonia. And I'll wrap up, I'll wrap up this question in, in, in a bit. Give me, give me an organism. And as I'm doing that, I'm I'm scanning the other answer choices. Thank you so much for, for putting stuff in the chat. Yeah, strep pneumo, super common. Haemophilus influenzae, also very common. Um, and what I do when I look at the answer choices is I read the answer and then I ask myself, does this explain a low bar pneumonia? So does mycoplasma pneumoniae explain a low bar pneumonia? I would say no, because typically that's an atypical pneumonia. You know, you have bilateral infiltrates. Um, often they'll give you, um, uh, sometimes it's associated with some hematologic abnormalities like a, like a hemolysis picture. So that doesn't quite fit. Pneumocystis, sim for similar reasons, it's typically bilateral fluffy alveolar infiltrates, not uh, low bar. Um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the history is not really suggestive. Um, four days is not the typical time course. Usually it's more subacute. You're just sort of piecing all of this together. And again, bacterioides, anaerobe, thinking of aspiration. I'm not hearing something in this picture that really points strongly in that direction. Whereas answer C, streptococcus pneumoniae, super common cause of low bar pneumonia. And I would also add that the, the point that trips students up is thinking, oh, strep pneumo is for low, uh, low bar pneumonia in the immunocompetent. This person has HIV. And that's why my comment halfway through um, is pertinent is in that folks with who are immunocompromised can get regular infections, just like folks who are immunocompetent. All right, that was a lot for one question. Hopefully that was useful. I'll pause to see if there's any initial questions. If not, we have one more case for you and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. And, and while I look for questions, anything to add there, Michael, in terms of strategy or, or teaching points? I just have one teaching point that's been relatively useful for me 
Um, I totally agree with you. The easiest way to discern in this question is the, the fact that it's a low bar pneumonia. Additionally, I would encourage everyone to look out. Uh, patients in questions who present with pneumocystis pneumonia tend to have quite low oxygen saturation. That, that tends to be a feature that they highlight that the patients have a low oxygen saturation despite appearing quite well. Um, so this person with a pulse ox of 98%, again, it doesn't rule it out for me. It's just something that's been helpful for me to pay attention to in the past. Totally agree. And it's absolutely um, a good teaching point because the level of hypoxia can drive your management. Like, do you give, do you give steroids, for instance? Awesome. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions per se. So we'll move on to our last, uh, our last question, bit of a shorter question. Um, again, I'll, I'll use my tried and true uh, approach of reading the, the question, which of the following should be the next step in management. So again, I'm, I'm reframing. The diagnosis is probably going to be pretty clear in this case, or at least I'm going to have to make some sort of diagnosis, but then the second order will be management for this patient. So here we have a 58-year-old uh, female presents with shortness of breath and chest pain that worsens with inspiration over the past two hours. So again, reframing. Middle-aged woman, acute dyspnea, and pleuritic chest pain. And just with that, what diagnosis jumps into your mind? Chest pain, dyspnea, which is pleuritic. If I'm thinking morbidity, what, what could kill someone with that picture? Yeah, folks are jumping all over this in the chat. You're absolutely right, a PE. So my spidey sense is already tingling, but I think that a pulmonary embolism um, is something I have to seriously consider. And so for the rest of the vignette, I'm just going to be looking for things that either support or refute that hypothesis. This patient has a four-pack year smoking history, is on hormone replacement therapy. And, and for those of you in the crowd, there should be a number of these things that are now really pinging um, for severe menopausal symptoms, is on metformin for type 2 diabetes, lisinopril for CKD, vitals, um, with a, a low grade, doesn't quite meet the 38 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit, but you know, the temperature is a little bit above what we would consider normal. Tachycardic, um, with the elevated respiratory rate and uh, a blood pressure that is pretty normal, O2 sat, um, with, that is below normal. So again, reframing acute pleuritic chest pain with dyspnea in a uh, middle-aged woman, with several risk factors uh, for VTE, essentially, venous thromboembolism. Um, the long auscultation is normal bilaterally. Again, that's less for making a diagnosis of PE, but more for just more evidence that it's not other things. You know, in contrast to the last question, I'm not seeing focal lung findings. The exam is notable for jugular venous distension. Here's a trick. Don't, you don't want to take one piece of data in isolation and hinge your entire diagnostic on that. Folks often learn JVD, it's got to be heart failure. Not always. Really keep in mind the overwhelming sort of history, exam, vitals to help make your diagnosis because there are non-CHF reasons for uh, jugular venous distension. And, and really the clincher here is right calf swelling and erythema. And she has significant calf pain with forced dorsiflexion. And that brings us back to our question, what should we do next? And I will admit that this one is tough because our paradigm in medicine is often diagnose, then treat. Otherwise we're you know in the dark. But here we really wanna be very thoughtful. And, and I will get to, there's two essential teaching points here. The first, is the concept of pre-test and uh, post-test probabilities. And that's just a fancy way of saying, how confident am, am I in the diagnosis at the current stage and how would future diagnostics change that? So here's a fun little exercise. In the chat, we, we think we've made a clinical diagnosis of PE. How certain are you that this is PE? Give me a percentage between zero and 100. What, how, what would you all peg this at? 
And I really appreciate folks uh, putting their answers in the chat. And so far, the, the gestalt that I'm getting is that it's high. It's really, really high. The way they've constructed this question is that you should be like 80 to 90% sure that this is PE from a test, from a test writer perspective. And so then the question becomes, if I get a diagnostic, how likely, you know, if, if I'm moving from 90 to 95% or 95 to 99%, well, I don't really need that test in the first place. I'm not saying you wouldn't get the test, but in this patient who is on the sicker side, they're tachycardic, their respiratory rate is high, they're hypoxic, I might not want to wait until a CT scanner is available and they're down there by themselves. I don't want them to code down there. So I'm just highlighting the, the thought process. First, the branch point is, am I diagnosing or am I treating? This patient is sick enough and I'm confident enough in my diagnosis to say I'm, I'm, I favor treating. And secondly, um, the second uh, branch point is then, well, what, what do I treat them with? Um, and the treatment for PE, not to belabor this point, is with heparin. Now, I will step back and point out something uh, that is important clinically, but sometimes we don't really get to do on these exams, is that there are clinical decision tools that we can use. So for instance, the well score, there's a well score for DVT, there's a well score for PE. And we're not going to do it now, but we, if we plugged in the values for this patient, or you know, if we made up some values consistent with the, with the, um, with the vignette, this patient would have a sky high score for, for PE. And this is actually what we do in clinical practice. If the, uh, if the well score is high enough, is our, if our clinical suspicion is high enough, and if the clinical scenario is such that treatment is needed on the more sort of urgent uh, timescale, then we would go ahead and treat with anticoagulation, in this case, with a heparin infusion. Um, so I'll pause there, see if there's any questions that come through in the chat. Michael, if there's anything else that you'd want to highlight here, uh, would would welcome your your input. Yeah, um, masterfully handled. I, I agree with you. I was calculating this person's Wells PE score. It's quite high. Um, there's one comment in the chat about like, uh, do I treat this person? Do I diagnose this person? Um, there's sort of maybe two points I'd like to make quickly. One is that if you can get yourself to a 50-50 guess on a question, you've done yourself a service. Because if you think about the minority of questions that you don't know, if you 50-50 odds for all of them, you're going to do quite well on the exam. So I think to Moses' point, I probably wouldn't ultrasound this person. It's not going to change what I do. It doesn't help me to, to diagnose PE. I know D-dimer is not helpful in someone who has a high pretest probability of having a PE. Um, they have chronic kidney disease, so I'm probably not going to CT scan them with contrast. Right. If I was going to do a diagnostic test, it would be a VQ scan. And then to Moses' point, do I treat? Well, I'm only deciding between A and C. So it's not super satisfying, but I would encourage any of you who got to that point logically in your brain, you actually did a really good thing, right? You knew a whole lot of medicine. And if you can do that on most questions of the test, you're going to be quite successful. It doesn't feel great. The other point, and so hopefully that, and then I'll make a clinical point here. Often we, and Moses, I, you and I haven't really talked about this, and I, would be interesting to see how you feel. So oftentimes we jump to treating a PE when there's evidence of right heart strain or hemodynamic instability. Um, mm -hmm. And so sometimes they'll give you the person has an elevated troponin and that's their way of telling you that that heart is angry. Sometimes they'll give you abnormal BP, you know what I mean? Sometimes they'll show you an echo showing right heart, the echo shows right heart strain. In this question, I'm curious on whether or not the presence of JVD is implicating right heart strain and would be sort of the last piece of information I needed to tilt towards treating this person clinically versus, you know, I mean, doing a diagnostic test. And I think if, can you see what I'm drawing? Yes. Great. So this is what I'll typically draw for students, right? So I'll draw the right heart, I'll draw the lung, and I'll draw the left heart, right? So we often learn about like exactly to Moses' point that JVD equals heart failure. Well, if you think about sort of what we typically learn with heart failure is that the left heart is broken, fluid backs up into the lungs, which backs up into the right heart, which backs up, this is my terrible SVC and IVC over here, right? So this would be where I would have JVD. If you think about it differently, right, any pathology within the lung itself can sort of cause strain on the right heart and that could lead to JVD, right? So sort of core, core pulmonality. And then in this question in particular, 
we're sort of implicating the pulmonary arteries themselves as causing backup to the right heart, right heart causing JVD. So that alone for me is a sign that this clot is clinically significant enough that I would want to treat it. I don't really care about proving it's there. I'm pretty convinced it's there um, and moving forward. And so just to review, you can also, like any other signs of right heart strain, the S1, Q3, T3 abnormality is also a sign of right heart strain, but that's not specific either. Yeah, that's wonderful. The, the other little teaching point that I would give that might be generalizable is sometimes they will, the test writers will throw in a little reason why you wouldn't get a diagnostic test. And so in this case, this patient has CKD, a contrast load, uh, carries a measure of risk. And then you ask yourself, you know, can I optimize them in some way? Can I get a diagnostic that might take a little bit more time down the road? But it's it's both the evidence that there might be right heart strain, which I, I totally love that point because sometimes you do even more advanced things like um, sort of interventions to, to get rid of the clot, which is beyond the scope of, of our discussion now um, when there's evidence of significant uh, right heart uh, strain and, and instability. Um, so that part, part's awesome. And then I'll just couple that with sometimes they'll throw in a little clue here or there to just make you pause and think like, do I actually want to get the diagnostic test? Um, not because that's the clincher, but just as one more piece of the puzzle um, to make you feel more comfortable about going one direction or the other. These are hard. I, I will uh, I concur with the person in the chat who said these are really hard questions. Uh, I agree. They're hard, not just on the exam. Let me tell you, they're hard in real life uh, to figure out uh, what to do for folks. Um, Awesome. This was a, a really uh, a really great discussion. Um, Michael, I'll keep an eye on the chat. You mind telling folks a little bit more about MST and then, uh, oh, and just to clarify for the answer, the answer is to anticoagulate. Um, but I'll keep an eye on the chat for anything else. Yeah. So um, as Moses alluded to in the beginning, sort of who we are at Med School Tutors and then sort of what I'd like to talk about is how we interface with you. Um, I think you saw that both Moses and I really like to dork out over medicine and, and teach medicine and help people kind of understand how to, to get to questions and, and how that bleeds into clinical practice, right? So you, I mean, what we were both talking about was decisions we make all the time for people in the hospital. Um, ways that we both particularly love to work with students is also in a more one-on-one -on -one fashion. Um, so what that looks like is typically a custom study, study schedule. So helping sort of be that accountability partner, but also uh, a more professional lens at looking at strengths and weaknesses and helping sort of triage time and resources. Um, and then when we meet together, exactly what we did today, going through questions, um, there are some topics that I, I'm sure I, I would have Moses teach me about blood and cancer all the time. And I would love to teach people about the pathways that lead to an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. Like there's certain things that we really love to help people understand. Um, Within the company, we also do sort of planning sessions. If you're like, hey, I, I just really need some help sort of grounding myself and figuring out where to go from here, um, as well as help with coursework too. Imagine most of the step two people are beyond that, but uh, for your friends. Amazing. I've been responding to a few questions in the chat. We'll, we'll leave it open. You know, I, I realize we've gone beyond the, the hour mark here. So we have time maybe for one more question if there is one. Uh, and if not, we will uh, we will be signing off and letting you all get on with your evening. Another five or 10 seconds. Um, while we wait, I just wanna uh, thank you all for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Michael couldn't have said it any better. Uh, we nerd out about this stuff. Um, ultimately, we're all on this uh, journey together. These tests are just one step towards uh, achieving, achieving those goals. And if we can in any way be helpful for you, um, you know, it's our pleasure to, to do so. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions, Michael. Thanks for hanging out with me. This has been yeah, a lot of fun. You. Yeah, y'all give us some feedback in the form listed in the chat and have a good rest of your night. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.